dignity, stability, and development. As a matter of history, the NDC is an offshoot of the government of the PNDC led by the late President J.J. Rollins as its chairman. The history of the formulation of the party is long, but for the purpose of today's event, I will cut a long story short by saying that when the country decided in 1992 to return to constitutional rule through the referendum of April 1992, the PNDC as a government also decided to float a political party for the purpose of contesting any democratic elections that were to be conducted to usher into office any constitutional government under the new dispensation. The idea of forming the NDC was mooted and many brains were brought together to work out a program to bring the idea into fruition. This culminated into the establishment of the NDC as a political party. In the forefront of the discussions were functionaries of the PNDC, the KBES, members of the 31st December Women's Movement, the June 4th Movement, and many other progressive forces. After the discussions, deliberations, and consensus buildings, eventually the NDC was formed and launched on the 10th of June 1992 at the Art Center as a party in preparation towards the general elections to be conducted later in November 1992. An interim national executive committee was put in place, chaired by the late Alaj Yusuf Wali, to steer the affairs. Other officers were also appointed to support him. In due course, many other political parties also emerged, including the MPP, the PH, PNC, PHP, NIP, NCP, EGIL, etc., etc. So the grounds was a god for political parties and political activities. The NDC quickly put its house in order and went to Congress on the 19th September 1992 to elect its national officers and the presidential candidate to contest the 1992 presidential elections. The NDC contest elected Flatter J.J. Rollins at its presidential candidate at its Congress in Cape Coast. Indeed, the NDC candidate, Fly Lieutenant J.J. Rollins, won the presidential elections held on 3rd November 1992 with a resounding victory, leaving the other political parties, with the exception of the NCP and the Eagle parties, in complete tatters. As a result of the humiliation other parties suffered, they boycotted the subsequent parliamentary elections, which were con contested by the parties of the Progressive Alliance made up of the NDC, the NCP, and the EGL. Fellow Akatamansunians, from then on, the NDC had come to stay as a strong political force and remains so to date. The MPP, the MPP won the 2000 election, and all attempts were made to annihilate the NDC. But trust me, the party survived and remained resilient despite all the machinations intimidations and harassment it went through. After the defeat of the NDC in 2000 elections, the supporters and members of the party were so much demoralized and down-spirited that something needed to be done about the situation. As a result, a national reorganization committee was established. The committee was chaired by Dr. Ubeda Samoa, which then told the whole country with a view to solicit ideas from the rank and file of the party members and also to bring hope to the people. The strategy worked like magic as the party. The strategy worked as magic as it rekindled the spirit of our grassroots members. Some new life was injected into the party. It is the spirit which culminated into the holding of the April 2002 Congress at La, in, at Trade Fair in La, which new executives were elected to steer the affairs of the party. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, I must state that between the period of 2001 and 2002, the NDC went through the worst part of its history. So determined 
was the MPP to decimate the NDC that the then the majority leader in parliament at that time, the late J.H. Mensah, in describing the future of the NDC, made a statement to the effect, and I quote, by the time we finish with the prosecution of all the, these NDC people, there will be no party left. But the NDC, but the NDC remained unruffled and soldiered on. We put the pieces together after the 2002 Congress and started working hard. Yes, we demonstrated the indomitable spirit of the never say die until the bones are rotten and the kuma prima apembeba spirit to move the party together. Then in 2004 election, the NDC made a very strong showing which shocked the MPP and Ghanaians. In fact, as a result of the performance of the NDC in the elections, a panic-stricken MPP led by the late Jake Obichibi Lamte rushed to the seat of government, the castle, and hurriedly organized a press conference and announced the results of the election and declared the MPP as the winners of the elections, even when the Electoral Commission had not announced the official results. This was a harbinger of coming events as the MPP eventually was defeated in the 2008 election and the NDC came back and formed the government led by His Excellency Professor John Evans Atamnes. Ladies and gentlemen, Your flight is ready to leave. Sit back and relax and enjoy the flight. Sugar-free, freshly squeezed fruit juice 
choose green line fruit juice and smoothies filled with vitamin C, calcium, iron, fiber and zinc. Every drop of green line juice and smoothies is naturally made to give you energy, good health and refreshment. Enjoy your favorite green line orange pineapple passion, watermelon, pineapple and turmeric, pineapple beetroot, pineapple and ginger, and healthy green. Green line fruit juice and smoothies, powered by nature. NDC, the Interbating Hospital in Cape Coast, the Hope Regional Hospital, the Accra Ridge Hospital, the Sunyani Regional Hospital, the Koforubia Regional Hospital, the Tamale Teaching Hospital, the Wild Regional Hospital. Every regional hospital in this country is the handiwork of the NDC. Come and talk about education. All the polytechnics were put in place by the NDC. And we upgraded them into technical universities. There were only three public universities in this country. Any other public university was put in place by the NDC government. Talk about the University of Development Studies. Talk about the University of Health and Allied Sciences in Ho. Talk about the University of Energy and Renewable Studies in Sunyane. Talk about the University of uh, Sustainable Development and Environment in Somalia. And then every tertiary institution that has been put in place, NDC is credited with it. In the secondary education, we cannot talk about it. Every monumental development at the secondary level, including the e blocks, were put out by the NDC government. And we are proud of our achievement. You go to the water systems, the K3 water supply, the community water and sanitation, the small water supply systems, everything in terms of water supply in this country. Tell our opponents to engage us in debate and we'll tell them that in terms of infrastructure development, in terms of supply of services to this country, NDC, we are head and close apart when it comes to any comparison. So, ladies and gentlemen, fellow Akatamansonians, let us be proud of our achievement. We must be proud of our achievement in government and out of government. We have lived up to the motto of the party, unity, stability, and development. We have brought unity in this country. We have brought about stability to this country. We, to cap it all, we have certainly brought unprecedented development in this country. We have won four general elections. We have performed better during our term of office than our opponents. We have, who have used propaganda to throw dust in the eyes of the discerning Ghanaians. Therefore, we have every reason to celebrate the party 30 years. As I have already stated earlier, we have a good and better record than others. Going forward, we are focused on re-equipping, retooling, repositioning our party to prepare ourselves to win the next election and form the next government. God be our helper. We will surely, inshallah, we will surely win and form the next government. Once again, I salute all those who have contributed to bring the NDC to this far. The former appointees, the former DCEs, 
former MPs, former ministers, former executives, at every level of the party, and the current 137 gallant MPs and our national executives. I salute all of you. Long live the NDC, long live Ghana. Akatamansu is the party of choice. NDC is the party today, the party tomorrow, and the party for the future. Thank you, and God bless us all. And That's a long way to go, but I've come to stay. Kedas may go, Kedas may come, but the revolution has come to stay. Revolution, revolution, revolution. Has a long way to go, but I come to stay. Hey! Thank you very much. Indeed, we have a tradition to be proud of, and we have a chairman to be proud of. He remains one of those who continue to inspire the next generation. Dedicated his adult life to the service of this party and this country. A former Baba, an elder of the church, a former DC, former Minister of State, Vice Chairman of the party, Director of Elections, and now the Chairman of the party. A round of applause. Sorry, a former photographer, not Baba, former photographer. A round of applause for our Chairman, Chairman Ampofo. Thank you very much indeed. And like he has already indicated, by our culture, rain is considered a blessing, a good omen, especially when it visits at a time of an important activity such as we are having today. And indeed, we have every reason to celebrate because we have come far and we still have, we are still here with the journey ahead of us. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, if you are proud of the NDC today, shall we rise to sing a happy birthday for the party before we go into the lecture? Shall we do so? Shall we? Thank you. So, happy birthday to us. Happy birthday to us. Happy birthday to Happy birthday. Happy birthday to us. We are 30 old now. We are 30 years old now. We are 30 years old now. We are 30 years old now. Hip, hip, hip. Hey, God. Bless us now. May God bless us now. May God bless us now. May God bless us now. Hip 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 hip! Hooray! Thank you very much indeed. Please, let's do something. Let's do something. Thirty years is such a long time. And the lectures coming are going to be very invigorating. So please, let us give the party 30 hands clap. We have to show the journey we have made. That's where we start. No, let's do it together. Let's start. One, two, one, two, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen. 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. Slow it down. 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30. 
Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, I have the pleasure to invite, to begin with the lectures, taking us through the history of the NDC and the way forward. The longest serving general secretary of the NDC, Al Haji Hudu Yahya. Hello. Thank you very much, Honorable Soini. Mr. Chairman, Honorable Nana Atudazi, our National Chairman, Honorable Ufoso Ampofo, our running mate, 2020 presidential elections, our chairman, Council of Elders, Alaj Mama Idrisu, and former member of Council of States, I don't know whether it's honorable or ambassador, Kofiato to help me, is it honorable or ambassador? <laughs> Uh, Honorable Ambassador Beho, Vice Chairman, Council of Elders, and former Minister of Foreign Affairs, our General Secretary, Honorable Johnson Asie Dunketia, our, our some of our former appointees present on. Honorable Choboy, Honorable Tutubi Kwachi, former Minister, National Security, Honorable Kobra Dufo, former Minister of Finance, Honorable Mike Hammer, former Minister of Lands and Natural Resources and uh, Transport and Communication, our Honorable Members of Parliament present, all appointees, all executives, regional constituency branch present, I stand on the protocol already established. Uh, the chairman already asked us to do one minute silence, and which we did. But being the first general secretary to work with the elected executives of, since the party was formed. There are a lot of my comrades who are no more with us here. And I owe it a duty to mention some of them. I may not be able to mention all of them. And more so, what I'm going to do has already been done for me. If you look at the brochure, the document, uh, the book we have, <laughs> the history of the party has already been put there. <laughs> so, pardon me, uh, permit me, because we sit here very simply today, but those who were there when the party was being crafted and how the party started, those who are still with us here will appreciate. And it will be an honor that at least we remember them today. We have our founder and our first president under the Fourth Republican Dispensation, His Excellency Flight Lieutenant Rawlings, His Excellency Professor J. E. Mills, Justice Annan, first speaker of the Fourth Republican Parliament and member of the First Council of Elders, 
Mr. Yusuf Wale, Honorable A.A. Munufiye, were our first national chairman. They acted as co-chairman. Our Honorable Captain Kojo Chikata, Minister of so member of the First Council of Elders, the meetings used to be held in his house, who was also Chief Whip. Dr. Kaiku, he was the Interim General Secretary before we went for, to Congress. Jacob Baba was my deputy. We were meeting at Ravico Hotel. We we're having National Executive Committee meeting, planning the next Congress when Jacob Baba fell from his chair on the table. So he died with the weapon in his hand. In other words, he died in action. Mr. R. H. Achab, reti retired. Ambassador Major R. H. Achab, retired. He was founding member. He signed the party into being. And he was a member of the National Executive Committee, and later our ambassador to Burkina Faso. Mrs. Ernestina Lemote was first treasurer, deputy treasurer and later became deputy national women organizer. Madame Siao Sapore was our first women organizer from Segei. Mr. Koko Ankuma was our first national organizer. And now let me also remember Honorable Mary Jan. She was the first MP of our first parliament to pass on to eternity. She also died in duty. She left parliament and was rushing to her constituency on the Winneba Road to New Edubiasi. She was MP for New Edubiasi. She had a car crash and died on the spot. Honorable Abeyi was our first chairman of Ashanti region, who also later became a member of Council of State. Alaj Muhammad Umeida was our first chairman of the party in the northern region. And then when he died, Alaj Gedo Suleimana, who was his vice, took over. And when Alaj Gedo Suleimana died, his vice, Alaj Suleimana Zakari, took over. All of northern region. Alaji Dapore was the first chairman of the Upper East Region. He was a Second World War veteran. And he would always walk with his walking stick. And you dare not stop him from any party activity or party function. He will, with his walking stick, one after the other, he will get to wherever we will get to. And don't stop him. That was how dedicated people were. Mr. Aniwena was our vice chairman for the Upper East Region. Mr. Anaba was also our regional secretary of the Upper East Region when the party was put together. Mr. Apasinaba was a founding member and became member of the Council of Elders of the Upper East Region. Mrs. Satukuba, who used to be nicknamed First Lady because she wore her party colors throughout the week, very, very dedicated, Professor Raymond Atubwe's mother, very, very dedicated. And likewise, his husband, Mr. Atubwe, who also became a member of the Council of Elders of Upper East and retired as regional director of the Upper East region. They are bo they've both gone to eternity. Mr. Segbeji was a quantum surveyor, a consultant. He became the first chairman of Volta region, and he was a member of our fundraising committee. He did a lot. Because contrary to what most people thought, that because President Rawlings was chairman of PNDC and we were emerging from PNDC into the Fourth Republic, oh, the party had, was awash with funds. No way. He would not allow it. So we went into the elections in 1992 without vehicles. People had to use their own private vehicles. He will not allow it. And we had to raise the money ourselves. So Mr. Sebeji was very, very helpful. Having been 
a consultant in the construction industry. He was very helpful in the raising of funds for the party. Mr. Nunye was his vice. And after Mr. Sugbeji passed, Mr. Nunye took over. He too is in, gone to eternity. Honorable Captain Glenn Sou, we all know him, that he gave his all to the party. Mr. Glenn Sou was our first MP for the Angola constituency and later was the constituency chairman for Airways West in Greater Accra. Mr. Owajiman was our first chairman for Western Region. Very, very, very committed man. Mr. Francis Aivo was our first administrator in the party headquarters, and to him, with him, we put the first administrative structure in the party office. And he had a, lot of, a number of young men who were very, very dedicated, and with them that we formed the first administrative structure in the party office. Kisi Edu also was uh, my secretary, my, you know, the general secretary's secretary. W.O. Boni, W.O. Tanachi, Aladio Kobna, John Agovi. John Agovi closed from office when we were in opposition and was going to his uh, place uh, on the Sawam Road where he crashed into a moving vehicle and died on the spot. Ebo, Teteko, these were all... Uh, uh, these were all staff of the party headquarters, the pioneer, pioneer staff in the party headquarters who helped to build the structure up. Mr. Samoa was our first vice chairman for Western Region. He and Mr. Kufo, Mr. Kufo was also our, you know, Mr. Samoa and Mr. Kufo were the two first vice chairmen of the Western Region. Mr. Kufo, uh, I understand was uh, a cousin to the former president Kufo. Uh, he was very, very committed and very dedicated to NDC. I like Mama Fusini died, I think, uh, early this year. He was first original organizer, became vice chairman, regional vice chairman for Western Region, and then deputy national coordinator of the Hajj Committee, uh, of the Zongo Caucus. And he was also vice chairman of the Hajj Committee. I remember also late Honorable Busumchi Sam, who was the first MP for Second D. And Nana Chirufo was one time the best national farmer and became the, a member of the first national executive committee of the party after the Congress in Cape Coast in 1992. Mr. Kofi Minta was our first chairman of the Central Region. Mr. Ampindankwa was our deputy national organizer and one time uh, deputy minister of information and the honorable Totobi Kwachi. Mr. Ampindankwa had a, a bar, a, a chop bar, just at the, when you get to Nkoko and you are turning towards Kumasi. It used to be called Berman Kwain or something like that. Yeah. This tells you the character of NDC, that it was not an elitist party. It was a party for all. You had farmers in it. You had humble and simple people like Mr. Ampindankwa in it, playing very high rules. Dr. Alaji Farouk Braima was a member of the National Executive Committee. He first was with the Eagle Club, and we've, together we formed the Progressive Alliance to fight the 1992 presidential elections. And then later he became MP for Ayawasu East. Then Mr. Iwajiman was a member of the National Executive Committee. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, George, Mr. George Amos, he was a cadre of the June 4th and he was a member of the National Executive Committee from Central Region. Our very, very, very vibrant, very active, very committed Mr. J.W. Ajakum, our former national organizer. Commander Johnson was also our former national organizer. Honorable Ajay Boy Sekan, was our CDR organizer 
for Greater Accra and became our first MP for Teshi in the first parliament. In fact, he, he, was, he was a lawyer before he passed. Professor Kote Papafiu was our chairman for Greater Accra who did a lot in, you know, to strengthen the party in Greater Accra, bringing in, cutting across, bringing in a lot more very, you know, uh, very key people of the Greater Accra region into the party because of his approach. Mahama Adams of Bronga Hafu. Mahama Adams was a cadre, and he became uh, he became a member of the executive committee of Bronga Hafu region. And Mama Adam came to Accra for a party meeting on his way back at Suhum. In fact, I was the first person to get to the, you know, to, I, of, I was the first party person to get to the, uh, the scene of the accident. Because when I was coming, I had NDC, uh, what should I say, muffler in my car. So somebody stopped me and said, you are ending. I said, yes. That, oh, this somebody has just got an accident and we saw a party card in his car. NDC party card in his car. I said, where? He took me there. By the time I got there, he had been rushed to the hospital. When I got to the hospital, they led me to the mortuary. Yeah. That is the kind of dedication people have shown. That, he had no business in Accra. He was just called to Accra for an emergency meeting. And this was how he got back to Accra. And he was traveling with the wife. From there, I went to see the wife. Wife asked, where's mama? Hi, it's my husband. I, what could I say? You know, we had to manage the situation. Mr. Eddie Palmer, another very committed person in Greater Accra. He was our, our, our vice chairman and later became our chairman. And then, Alaji E.A. Tete. Alaji E.A. Tete. Alaji E.A. Tete. He was with GPRTU. He was GPRTU chairman, and he later became our chairman. Yes. And then, Mr. Vincent Assise, our first press secretary. These are some of what I can remember. This, by all means, these are not all. Pardon me, those I have not mentioned, because the time, we don't have that much time. But at least, this represents them all. And we want to say that NDC is grateful to them for the seed that they have sown and the water they had used to water the seed for the seed today to grow into a tree. We are grateful to them. To their families, we say, Aiko. Whatever they have left behind, whatever they have left behind, we want to promise them that we will not let the tree die. We will not let the tree die. And it's up to the youth who are coming up. Mr. Chairman, I have a very difficult job to do. I was told I should speak about the history of the party. But the chairman who had became an external examiner, and now to Dazi, he came and gave us the, the syllabus within which we had, to, <laughs> we had to speak. He had covered everything. And then the national chairman added more, and then Kofi Ato, my former deputy, had already written the whole thing inside the document here. So what am I going to say? <laughs> but let me say, while we are still alive here, let me say, for those of us who are alive and in this hall, we are very indebted to Alaj Mama Idrisu. Some may not know, but right from day one, 1982, January, Elijah Mahmoud has not rested. He has given his all to this country. He has given his all to this party. And I can speak with authority because I studied under his feet. And I say I studied under his feet because I didn't know I was studying. I had never been involved in multi-party politics. I had only just been Keda, 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 Keda. So, 19, you know, in a time, Alaji was being invited to a function he would send for me. We should go. 
And sometimes when we are driving, at that time, we didn't have the comfort of planes. In fact, in 1980s up to PN, up to the NDC time, there were no aircrafts. Even the military did not have the aircraft. The aircrafts were grounded, no parts. So it was always by road. And the roads were terrible. So when we reach a place, you ask, so you people, any time you people you are traveling, you go and sleep in the residency. So when you are out of government, where are you going to sleep? I never understood this question until we were in opposition. That was when I began to learn about multi-party organization. I like, uh, if Obed were here too, I would say we pay the same homage to Obed. These two legends have done a lot to bring about this party as we are celebrating it 30 today. And may the good Lord. And let me also say, Elijah's vice, Honorable Victor Behu, he was then Ghana's permanent uh, representative at the United Nations. And as if he was not outside the country, because every now and then Mr. Victor Behu was in Ghana for consultations. I mean, to come and get involved in the local, you know, local things here. It was as if he was not, you know, outside the country. Likewise, Professor Awuno, to all we say we are indebted. I cannot go one after the other, one after the other. But, Mr. I, I hope you, you don't mind as I give these anecdotes. Please. I'm not here to... Professor Dansu is going to give the professorial lecture. As for me, I was general secretary, so I'm going, only telling you how organization was going. <laughs> Nana Tudazi mentioned about how we went for the certificate and had to go back because we didn't carry money. We thought, as usual, it was Kida Week. We didn't know that we were now coming to a real political organization. But he has forgotten to mention... When we took President Rawlings' forms around the whole country to get it signed, we went to his office. I was there in his office with Mr. Tutubi Kwachi and uh, Alara Ajite and so on. We looked through and we discovered that some of our cadres had decided to do shortcuts. And if that had gone to Electoral Commission and they had gone through, it, it would, have, would have been disqualified because we would have been beaten by time. So that night, we had to send people back to a front place. And it was a front place that they committed that error. That night, how we managed to cross that, only God knows, uh, cross that water. And got the things back before dawn, the following day for me, as General Secretary, to carry the forms to Electoral Commission to Afarijan. That was for the 1992 elections. And at that time, 1992, we used not to ballot we used to f go by first come, first serve. So myself, Ajay Boy Shikan, you can't tell me five minutes because, uh, what, what is it? Uh, hold on, uh, Kofi Ato told me 30 minutes, but I'm not taking 30 minutes anyway. <laughs> uh, the following day, when I went, uh, no, in fact, I didn't even go home. I, 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 didn't, I, I didn't go to sleep. I just went home and changed and called Ajay Boy Sikan, who was then the regional secretary of Greater Accra, called Sly Mensa, called uh, Aladi Yaukundo, uh, Vanderpoy, for them to get some other chaps to uh, join us. And we went to the Electoral Commission and slept there from 12 midnight till the following morning because we wanted to get JJ on, on the number one pos, you know, place on the ballot. So for 1992 and 1996, it was first come, first serve. And that was how we always managed to get President Rawlings on top of the ballot as number one. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, we have already been told how our party was named. Our founding fathers who gave us this party wanted this party to be different from Political, other political parties that had passed through this country, a political party that, that was truly national, a political party that was truly a party for the ordinary people. 
And that was how come we, got, we were given the name National Democratic Congress. National because we were not tribalists. We were not elitists. We wanted a party that would cut across. And that is why some of the names of the executive committee members, you'll find farmers, drivers, GPRTU, professors, Professor Chumasi, who was one time a, sociolo a sociology professor at Legon, was a member of the National Executive Committee. So when we went for the National Executive Committee, you'll find farmers on it. You'll find drivers on it. You'll find professors on it. You'll find teachers like Mrs. Lomote and Co. We wanted a truly national party. And we wanted a democratic party, that a party that will start from the, gra from the ground and go up, but not a party that will be he top heavy and then bottom weak. No. And a Congress that we all come from different backgrounds and different tendencies. That is how our founding fathers gave us the name National Democratic Congress. So to, for the youth who are taking over, please learn this. The moment you shift, the moment you shift, the people will not identify the party again. They will know the party again. Let us try not to shift. Now, the preamble of our party, if we look at the bottom, it talks about our commitment to the 1992 Constitution. So whatever we are doing, we will be the last to breach the constitution. Our party constitution is, our, our, our party constitution mentions specifically that our party is committed to the 1992 constitution. And the, the chairman of the occasion, Nana Tudazi, mentioned how we came about regarding the 1992 constitution. Of course, some people boycotted because they said they wouldn't sit together with hairdressers and tailors and farmers. You know. but, the, but the tailors and farmers crafted the constitution and which they are benefiting now. Because if you are a president or a presidential candidate, it's as a result of the existence of the 1992 constitution that you have, you have, you have, you have become one. Our motto, as you say, is unity, stability, and development. Why unity first? Please, anybody who says he's an NDC member, always work for unity. If there is a problem in the constituency or the branch and the party tries to resolve the issue, listen to the party, say that the party can be together. Of course, we are not saying don't speak your mind. Speak your mind. By the end of the day, please, the party must be together. Don't do anything that will break up the party. Our party, as I've already said, is a party that is from the grassroots across. So, in our constitution, we say we are a social democratic party. Social, we adopt social democracy as our philosophy. That is looking for the welfare and advancement of the ordinary person in society. And the ordinary person is a majority in society. So we, in other words, we are working for the majority of the people in society. 1992, no wonder, we won eight regions out of the 10 regions. So which party is national? Is it the party that got only two regions or the party that got eight regions? We won, it was only Ashanti and Eastern we didn't win, 1992. Likewise, 1996. And this was repeated in 2012 and 2000, you know, 2012. Mr. Chairman, let me say that our party constitution emphasizes a lot on the branch. And our founding fathers who gave us this party and gave us this constitution had a reason. Because if a building or a tree is, is going to be strong, it will be from the roots or the foundation. So if, and in fact, when I was general secretary, some people will come all the way from their regions, abandon their, their branch, abandon their constituency, abandon the region and come to the national. He's looking for party card. I said, we don't have party card. I said, me, even who do I I take my party card from my branch at Kalada Barak, Sabonjira in Tamale. <laughs> so, 
So our party, and no wonder this time around, the party, the National Executive Committee has placed so much emphasis on the branch that they have sent out committee, uh, uh, teams to the regions to look at, to do branch audit. So please, let's dedicate this 30th anniversary to the branch of the party. And we are... And that we are entering 2024 traveling on the wheels of the branches. And once we are traveling on the wheels of the branches, no one can, can beat us. So please, those constituency executives, ensure that no branches try to deny people who are qualified from getting the party cards or party membership. And I'm emphasizing those who are qualified. I'm not saying we should give to anybody. And then another thing I would say is that the chairman has already spoken about our achievements for this country, economically, politically, socially, constitutionally. We've, but it doesn't mean that we never had challenges. We had challenges. When we won the election in 1992, at that time, presidential and parliamentary used to be on separate dates. So when we won the presidential, and as uh, chairman and the, uh, the chairman of the occasion and the national chairman said, our opponents said no. So we were invited to the Pink House. That is the International Conference Center. That is each party, I mean NDC, we, we, we sent a delegation, we were invited by some religious people, you know, religious leaders. We, were, we sent our delegation, then the other political parties sent their delegation. And we met at the International Conference Center. And this is one thing which whenever the history of this Fourth Republic is being spoken about, our opponents will, will keep quiet on that. They wanted us not to, not to go for the par uh, parliamentary elections. And they wanted us to share the cabinet positions and then also share the seats in the parliament without going for elections. And we said no. We could not subvert the 1992 constitution because there was no provision for that. So if we had acceded to that, we would have been taking the lead ahead of Zimbabwe and Kenya in terms of what they call it, union government, whatever they call it, power sharing. Mr. Chairman, as you very well know, the challenges that the party had was first conflicts between MCEs slash DCs and constituency chairman. It was who was who. Chairman, I'm sure, I'm sure you remember that. <laughs> you had that problem, you know. And then conflicts between MCE, DCs, and MPs. Who was who? Because these were nov novel situations. We didn't have them before. So they introduced conflicts or contradictions. Then we had problems of executive committees and MCEs quarreling. MCEs or DCEs. Then we had conflicts between MCEs, DCEs, and assemblymen. Who was who? We had conflicts between assemblymen and branch executives. We had conflicts between regional ministers and regional chairmen of the party. Who was who? Some of them were still thinking of Nkuruma days, that the chairman used to be this, the chairman used to be this. But of course, this was a different dispensation. We had problems between regional executive committees and regional ministers. And we had problems between regional executive committees and regional parliamentary purposes. We had problems between CADA calls and regional party executives. We had problems between CADA calls and party constituency executives. We had problems between CADA calls and party national executives. But I, what I want to say is that the party was able to resolve this conflict and eventually there was harmony and unity amongst us again. But it wasn't one day, it took some time. Mr. Chairman, at this point, I would like to say that if we look at our election results between uh, 1996, uh, 2012, 1996, you know, to this 2020, you realize that 
there are a number of re, uh, constituencies where we had skirts and blouses. Where either the president will win and will lose the seat or will win the seat and the president loses. We will have to resolve this issue of the skirt and blouses. And I am saying that, Mr. Chairman, I am saying that we should make it a point. Anybody who can be proven that the person openly canvas skirt and blouse, the party should take very serious disciplinary action against such a person. Because the, the constitution, not only our constitution, but even the national constitution or the electoral law does not allow you to belong to two parties. So how can you say you are belong to NDC and you are campaigning for another? In fact, you are one of the MCs, where is Honorable, uh -huh, Honorable Suhili is here, he has a case in his constituency where some of a branch, a very, very strong branch in his constituency, the executives, not just ordinary members, went out campaigning for his op uh, opponent against him. And they occupy executive positions. They even took money, according to a complaint. He's got, he's got a petition with him. He's got a petition with him. So, I mean, in such clear cases, the party should take very, very, very serious disciplinary action against them. And it will serve as a lesson to others that we mean business. Mr. Chairman, let me also say that manitocracy, or what is it, manicracy or manito, whatever it is, manicracy, that is also something that will weaken our party. Yeah, that is also something that will weaken our party. Mr. Chairman, let's make it a point, and everybody should hear loud and clear, that when we are going to, for internal elections in the party, the questions that delegates should ask themselves should be, the person who wants us to vote for him, or who wants me, who, wa who wants my vote, the question should be, how long have you been in the party? Are you? Don't worry, I'll, I'll finish soon. Are you a committed, loyal person of the party? Can we do? Can we bear witness of you regularly participating in the party's activities at the branch, at the constituency, or the region? Because. Why I say so is that if we don't take time, it will be the highest bidder. And the highest bidder will not go and face the bullets. And let's also ensure that anybody who is aspiring to take a higher position is a person who we can prove that he had occupied a lower position so that he can acquire experience. And Mr. Chairman, anybody who is campaigning, please, anybody who has made his campaign to be based on tribal, religious, or factional lines, Mr. Chairman, if that can be proved, he should be disqualified. In the NDC, let's speak only one language, and that language is NDC. Let's go to only one mosque or one church, and that is NDC. What I mean to say is, I'm a Muslim, you are not a Muslim. But when it comes to party, please, let's put that aside. Let's talk about what will help NDC. After that, we go to our, I go to my mosque, you go to your church. Let Please, I'd like to emphasize this point. Let, us, let me not be misunderstood. It is, it, is, it is a fundamental human right for everybody to believe or pick which religion he wants to have. But what I'm saying is that when it comes to NDC, don't bring that in. Because when you bring that in, you will break the party. Yes. 
So I'm saying that anybody who wants to aspire to a position should not aspire to that position on tribal lines. He should not aspire to that position on religious lines. And he should not aspire to that position on regional lines. And he should not aspire to that position on factional lines. We don't want factionalism in the party. I've already spoken about the manicracy. Because if the manicracy, if we do not discourage it, we will come and have strangers leading the party. And when I say, please, 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 and when I say, and when I say, please, and when I say strangers leading the party, a party is built together by people who believe in certain ideals. So if you have not demonstrated how much you are convinced about those ideals, how can you fight for those ideals? And let me say, we lost eight people in the last election, 2020. Those people who died, did they, panic, did they pay money to go and die? You see? All right. So, Mr. Chairman, I've, I'm, I, pardon me for having taken a bit of time, but I thought uh, I should take us through a bit of memory line to, for us to honor our, some of our lost heroes who we can remember, those we haven't remembered, our prayers are with them. And I'd like to thank the organizers for putting together this very beautiful occasion for us. I thank you all very much. Thank you. Hey! Hey! Thank you very much, Alhaji Hudu. Yeah, yeah, demonstrating why he served as the longest general secretary of the great NDC. Well, there's some competition. Well, the longest vice chairman. No, I know, he's the first. I'll get to that. I know he's the first general secretary and also the longest serving. Oh, General Mozilla has broken the record. Has he? Okay, looks like General has broken the record now. But indeed, he is the first general secretary of the NDC. We thank you very much indeed for taking us through memory lane, celebrating the heroes who fell along the line, and also urging us to a path that will make our party even greater. We pray that at 60, many of you here will still be around to guide the party forward. In his presentation, he kept stressing the point about how the party was set up to be owned by the ordinary man. The ordinary man. Now this stress on the ordinary man's ownership of our party has led to a situation where sometimes our opponents tend to think that we are refrafs because of the disregard we are urged to have for societal class they think that we do not have the men. Now, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, our next speaker is from the Eastern region. Not like the one at the Flagstaff House. And perhaps the Eastern region would have been better served with the next speaker at the Flagstaff House. They would have been saved the embarrassment that the Eastern region is getting today. He was the chairman of our manifesto committee for the 2020 general elections, an academic diplomat. He's a prolific writer. Some of his publications include political biography of Dr. Kofi Abuzia, J.J. Rollins and the Democratic Transition in Ghana, Managing Election-Related Violence for Democratic Stability in Ghana, The African Brain Drain, Causes and policy prescriptions, and the African economic community, problems and prospects. He's a former ambassador to Cuba, former minister of health, former high commissioner to UK and Ireland, and former general secretary of UTAC, University Teachers Association of Ghana. Lectured at the University of Ghana, Lagon, 
lectured at the Clark University in Atlanta, and also a very proud member of the National Democratic Congress. Ladies and gentlemen, let us welcome Professor Dansu Buafo. Please a round of applause once again. In fact, our tradition is made up of great achievers. Dr. Nashiru, the former Bank of Ghana, I'm told, was one of his students. A round of applause for Prof. Thank you so much. Thank you so, <clears throat> thank you so much, my brother Suhini. I remember the very first time you interviewed me in Radio Gold. We are all very excited that Radio Gold is back on air. If there's anything we can do to keep it on air, we will do it. I hope you can hear me. <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, for this occasion, Chairman of Usuan Pofu, our dear sister and member of the lab, Professor Jinana Opukwa Jimai. Distinguished General Secretary of the Party, General Mosquito, the, the Honorable Mahama Idrisu, Chairman of the Council of Elders, Honorable Idrisu Bahama, I, uh, Mahama Idrisu, I haven't forgotten our times or the Minister of Health. I took over from him as a Minister for Health. At the time, he had been delegated by President Rawlings to take charge of the Ministry of Health whilst I, want, I wanted my business in Cuba. And he gave me several, several examples of how to behave in the ministry. So I was really a student of his and Alaji, as I keep saying any time I meet you, same song. Alaji, are you here? He used to, this is something he taught me. Now I'm coming to the ministry to meet the same people and therefore I should be extremely careful and learn from the history of my predecessors. The distinguished members of the NDC, and I wish to recognize all the individuals who constitute those we would consider members of the protocol list. If I have to go through all of it, I probably would exhaust the little bit of time that has been given me. So with all humility, our dear brother and senior comrade, uh, Dr. Kwabna Dufo, I acknowledge your presence and I do hope that uh, whatever we do here will be to the benefit of the party and to the country as a whole. Dear Akatabansonians, in fact, my work has been done because between Alaji Hudi Yahya, the chairman for the occasion, and chairman uh, of Usuan Pofo, there's very little for me to say. I was invited here to share with you some of the problems that we faced, some of the challenges that we anticipate, and some of the wars that we fought in the past. As you know, I therefore decided that this ought to be some form of a conversation rather than preparing a speech to be delivered. Because we have a lot of young people amongst us, and because the history of the party has not been adequately told, what we have in here doesn't tell the entire story. Whereas it is true that the NDC succeeded the PNDC, it is just too simple to say that we indeed inherited the assets and liabilities 
of the NDC, of the PNDC. And some of the challenges we had as we moved along could be traced back to the problems that the PNDC left for the NDC to solve. Back in the early 80s, getting down to the late 90s, we used to, there were some books that we read, and I think the young folks should go back and restudy some of these works. When our opponents talk about the NDC, the PNDC era, and they compare it con conveniently to what is being, what they seeing currently, they forget to mention the kind of difficulties or the state our dear country Ghana was in at the time the PNDC assumed power on December 31st, 1981. For all practical purposes at the time, Ghana was classified as a collapsed state. And this is not coming from me, for students of political science and for other writers. Ghana became a case study. How do we re-engineer Ghana from its collapsed finances? How do we engineer Ghana from its collapsed authorities? These were all discussed and analyzed in the book with the same title, Collapse States, edited by Professor Zatman. There was a ch the chapter on Ghana was written by Professor Dennis Rothschild. He had been a frequent visitor to the University of Ghana, a frequent lecturer, and had mentored younger lecturers like Professor Jimmy Bwedi and a whole lot of folks. So when we want to talk about the accomplishments and achievements of both the PNDC and the NDC, we should go back to the depth to which Ghana had sunk up to December 31st, 1981. Otherwise, we will miss the point. The greatness of the NDC, the greatness of the PNDC should be traced back to the kinds of problem-solving skills that were applied to re-engineer Ghana from where it was to where it became in 1992, when the country was being returned to civilian rule or democratic rule. My brothers and sisters, though we are told that the party was born 30 years ago, that was on 10th November 1982. That was precisely 11 years after the PNDC had been formed. When the PNDC left off and the NDC assumed power, we inherited a number of problems, social, economic, political, that we took over and tried to move on up until the year 2000. In 2002, in 2002 to be precise, the NDC declared social democracy as its official ideology. Prior to that, the NDC had not declared any official ideology, even though it subscribed to the tenets of the PNDC, that is probity, accountability, fairness, equality, uh, egalitarianism, and all of that stuff. So though we were practicing these, we were following these values, we had not declared a formal ideology until 2002. Now, if we practice egalitarianism, we are concerned about the poor, we are concerned about the masses, then of course, we needed to address the kinds of social and economic problems that afflicted this country. So you would see that coming to the 2000 elections, our opponents campaigned on the fact that though we cherished ourselves being uh, democratic socially and concerned about the poor, there were some socioeconomic problems in the country that we failed to address. Number one of these problems could be found in the health sector. The problems that we inherited associated with the so-called cash and carry system. And the fact that we 
we were told that we had done nothing about it until 2003 when President Kufo set up the National Health Insurance Scheme. Let me correct one thing, and I think it's critical that we address some of these issues. Because in the minds of some of our younger folks, we were incapable of addressing these issues. That when our opponents talk and criticize us, that we have no record in social programs, we have no record in programs that address poverty, deprivation, and the vulnerable, we keep quiet because we don't know the history, we don't know the circumstances under which the NDC quote unquote failed to address some of these issues. The NDC did not fail to address these issues. What happened was, especially the National Health Insurance Scheme, the NDC had done more work, more research, had engage more consultants to look into the provision of universal health insurance for this country than any other political party. The records are there. You see, back in 1991, back in 1991, under the PNDC, you remember there were some community mutual health insurance schemes across the country. These were supported, encouraged, and nurtured by the PNDC at the time. The first of these, we are told, or you can check from all the records, was the one started at Nkwanza St. Therese's Hospital. I don't know if there's anybody from Nkwanza. You can check this out. So that from here on, when anybody brings the, or introduces the topic of our inability to create or do anything, about the high cost of health care, you can stand your ground and argue. There was a PNDC secretary called Madame Dora, who was very actively involved in the Catholic Church at Nkuranza. There was a doctor called Dr. Bosman, who was a Ghanaian Dutch at the same time. She became so concerned about the inability of the citizens of Nkransa to assess health care. Why was this the case? Because you remember that in the mid-80s, the PNDC had gone into these negotiations with the International Monetary Fund, the World Bank, and introduced the Economic Recovery Program, as a result of which we introduced structural adjustment programs. That required us to also introduce cost recovery measures in all spheres, including healthcare. So most individuals could not pay these costs as a result of poverty, whatever. You will remember that the, NDC, the PNDC at the time also introduced what was classified as exemptions. There were specific exemptions in these areas where if you fell into any of the category of exemptions, you did not pay, especially if you are pregnant, children under five, the aged, the indigent, epidemics, snake bites, rabies. Anybody who suffered from these ailments did not have to pay for health for healthcare. These programs were so successful. So what the Catholic Church did was they introduced a community health insurance program where the Catholic Church provided funding to cushion the health care costs of citizens of Nkranza. This was very successful and it spread from Nkranza came to it came to Dodoa, it went to Brikum. Uh, several of these programs were also set up by the Koromai Association. It came to Kofodia. So within about a period of two, three years, there were seven of these across the country. And our strategy was to develop such schemes across the country so that every citizen who lived in any community would be covered under some form of mutual health insurance. 
This was what we had done as far back between 1999 and 2000. But then all the consultants we brought in advised that those mutual health insurance schemes would cover as many as 15% of our population. What happens to the remaining 85? We are for the downtrodden. We believe in equality, egalitarianism, and all of that. Could we have insurance policies for only 15% of the population? I suppose the larger majority of Ghanaians. So we decided that no, we will have to introduce an insurance policy that covered the entire, everybody within the confines of Ghana. How are we going to do that? Okay. A committee was set up under Mr. Graham, Graham Wilberforce. I don't know if anybody remembers the name. Uh, a report was given, and the there was a recommendation that we should set up a health endowment fund. This fund was supposed to take care of premiums, and charges associated with health, when the fund, when the scheme takes off. And if you look, you have a, if you have a library at home or your um, access to databases and so on, check the front page of the Daily Graphic of June 20th, the year 2000 where this fund report was presented and we decided that we will launch the fund in the year uh, by August at the time we set it up. Those of you who have worked in the Ministry of Health, these records are there. They are not being fabricated. All the necessary documents and preparations were made to be presented to cabinet. Unfortunately, the 2000 elections were upon us we did not have time because we were very optimistic that we were going to win the 2000 elections. And after the 2000 elections, these would be tabled before cabinet and then to parliament for implementation. That did not happen. But at the time we were leaving office in 2001, all the documents, the strategies, the mechanisms had been prepared, filed, and left in the office of the incoming government. And Alaju Mahama Idrisu is here. He will bear me out that he was in charge of collecting and collating the handing over notes of all the ministers by 2001. And he will remember that these reports, our reports were in there. So it was no surprise. It was no accident that come 2003, with the record we left, with the documents we left, with the strategies that we had designed, the MPP government took, took this and immediately announced the creation of a national health insurance scheme. So if anybody tells you that we were unable, we didn't know what we were doing, we didn't care for the poor, we didn't care for uh, the large masses of the Ghanaian population, that is not true. We had done the work. We envisaged that at some point in time, we will need a national health insurance scheme for everybody in the country. And the work had been done. If you, those of you from Kofrodia, Kweu, uh, Damongo, and uh, you can go back and check the status of the community health insurance schemes that were there under the PNDC, and that moved on to the, uh, to the NDC. There was another issue of which the NDC was accused of being negligent in terms of taking care of the vulnerable and poor in society. You know, by the year 2000, the NDC had built within that, the, period, the short period of 1992, and 2000, we had built, renovated, and rehabilitated more clinics, hospitals, and health centers than all the hospitals and clinics and health centers we had from colonialism up until 1982. This is a matter of record. No. 
But then we ran into a problem. The problem we ran into was that because of the structural adjustment programs and its negative and harsh impact on Ghanaians, including our medical doctors, we had a mass exodus of doctors from Ghana. And when you interview doctors and ask them what was the main reason for their migration to other countries, their number one response was the unavailability of postgraduate medical education. They, had, they informed us that it took the average Ghanaian doctor who wanted to specialize, who wanted to do postgraduate work, who registered in the West African College of Physicians. There, was a, there is a West African College of Physicians. It took him or her an average of seven years. And they decided that they could not wait. So they would leave. So you might have almost every year you hear that so many doctors were leaving. You also hear that there were so many strikes because conditions were tough. We needed to address that problem. You know. And President Rollins ordered us that whatever needed to be done to keep these doctors here, you must do it. So what did we do? We set up a committee. And these committees had Professor Nyame, uh, Dr. Kwachimafu, and all these MPP stalwarts in, you know, in, in that group. They were on the committee. The committee was chaired by Professor W.W. W. Brobe, at the time Dean of the Kwame Nkrumah University Medical School. He chaired it. They presented a report recommending that we set up a postgraduate medical school in this country. There were arguments that Ghana setting up its own postgraduate medical school was be, would be in contravention of the spirit of ECOWAS agreement. Then when we did research and dug further into it, we discovered that Nigeria has set up its own postgraduate medical school. So nothing prevented Ghana from setting, setting up its own postgraduate medical school. Professor Brobe's report was presented. We accepted it. And again, the documents and papers that were supposed to be presented to cabinet for approval and then to parliament was delayed and delayed until we were caught up in the 2000 elections. So again, Elijah, if you go back to the 2001 handing over notes that we left, all the documents, the strategies, and the methods of creating a postgraduate medical college were in there. So the school you see there, the Ghana College of Physicians and Surgeons, that we were accused of not having the foresight to create. I am telling you today, we had done all the paperwork. We had done all the research. We had done all the plans. We had done just about everything that needed to be done, except getting cabinet and parliamentary appro approval. So on that score, I think you can safely defend yourself. You know, at one, we also realized there were also those of you who are medical doctors. There were all kinds of problems, burns, and President Rollins was worried about. Any time he traveled through the hinterland, came back and said, "Look, I'm traveling around. I'm seeing burned ch children. Can't we set up something like this at Kolebu? Burns and reconstru plastic reconstructive unit." There was a doctor, and those of you who are old enough and were around 90s and 2000s, you will remember. Professor Mostadi, a Scottish doctor, came to Ghana, one of the foremost plastic surgeons in the world. He visited Ghana with a very small team. They met President Rollins, and President Rollins was so fascinated with the man, his devotion to Africa, and the fact that the man really wanted to do something to change the kinds of burns and plastic-related surgical problems we were facing in this country, especially among the poor and vulnerable. So, 
Dr. Mustadi came back after a trip to Scotland. He came back and recommended that we set up a small hospital, a 75-bed plastic and reconstructive surgical unit at Kolebu. And he promised Dr. Mustadi that he will pay, the, Ghana, the government of Ghana will pay half of the cost. And at the meeting with Dr. Mustadi, when President Rawlings assured him that 50% of the cost of constructing the hospital will be, will be paid by the Ghana government, Dr. Mustadi asked him, who then is going to build this hospital? And Dr. Musta President Rawlings turned to him and said, oh, why are you asking me that question? You are going to build it. And the rest is history. So what you see there, the plastic and reconstructive surgical unit at Kolebu, I think a new one has been built, but the old one and the pioneering work of this kind of work was started by us. And for some reason, we don't have or we don't create the required forum to impart this kind of information to our people. So anytime we are confronted with this health-related kinds of questions that are unable, we don't care about the poor, we just make noise about social democracy, blah, 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 we recoil because we can't put up any defense because we don't know, you know. So in addition to having these kinds of for I maybe every year or every 30 years or whatever, let's create opportunities for dialoguing and inviting individuals who have been lo around long enough. You mentioned, we, we just heard the number of our comrades who are no longer with us. By the next 30 year anniversary, most of us will not be around. What happens to the information we have? What happened to the kind of knowledge that we have? We'll go with it and we'll be sitting here with zero history of where the NDC has been and when the NDC is, where the NDC is supposed to go. So much for that. Let me also come back to the issue of ideology. I have already informed you that even though the NDC was founded in 1992, it took 10 years for the party to declare its official ideology as social democracy, which was 2002. Why was that the case? And you know, social democracy is not like property uh, ownership class or whatever. There are some values, some definitional issues that it makes it a little difficult to get people to understand and run with it. The unfortunate thing is that after 2002, when the ideology was declared, it had to take another 14 years for a school to educate us on these ideological issues, the Ghana Institute of Social Democracy, to be established in 2016, you know, for it's been done, but the party needs to double up and engage in political education, get our members to be on the same page. Do we all understand what we mean by social democracy? Do we all know what the values are? How do we get to be imbibed? Do we get to imbibe these values in us? These are very important issues. I do know that the school is doing what, what it can, but I think it's not enough based on lack of resources. So much for the history. We must look forward. Now, the challenges facing the NDC come 2024. I think those are more critical than some of the stuff we've been talking here. What do we do between now and 2024, win the elections? And what do we do after we've won elections? 
Because if the NDC were to win the 2024 elections and be confronted with the intractable problems we see in this country today, and we prove incapable of dealing with them, not only would we have destroyed our credibility, but we would also have eroded the people's belief in democracy. There is enough research to show that around the world, people are losing confidence in this whole democratic agenda because of its inability to deliver people from the poverty or meet people's expectations. Yesterday, we received news of new inflation figures. We do know that our debts are unprecedented. We owe so much. We all threw around the issue of debt to GDP ratio. We throw out the escalating uh, prices. We all know that because the fundamentals were weak, it has reflected in the exchange rate of the dollar or the CD. So come 2024, what do we do? What are we going to tell Ghanaians? How do we assure them that we are capable of meeting the challenges? And therefore, they should entrust us with power. My brothers and sisters, fellow Akatamansonians, I would want to, before we leave here, assure you that we have a team that is studying and monitoring everything that happens in our society. Whatever is being done, from the economy to infrastructure to governance to uh, the business, we are studying it and we are preparing solutions for these things. We don't want to wait until 2024 that people begin to ask, how do we deal with these problems? Because society would have changed drastically by 2024. Some of my colleagues who worked on the manifesto in 2020 are here. We've formed a team that we call the lab. We've set up several committees that are working on infrastructure, on economy, on tourism, on creative arts, me medical care, education, SAH, university education. Name it, we are working on it. We are monitoring what is done daily, what the MPP fails to do, what is not implemented right. We know, some of you will respond, that the, 20, the 2020 manifesto, the People's Manifesto, was not implemented because we didn't have the opportunity. And therefore, there may not be any need to rewrite the People's Manifesto. Not quite. The circumstances under which the People's Manifesto was written would have changed dramatically by 2024. The conditions under which the People's Manifesto was written would also have changed dramatically come 2024. So those of you who have heard some of what the NDC or some of us are doing, what we're we doing is we're taking the People's Manifesto and making comparisons with day-to-day -day occurrences in our society so that where feasible, where possible, where necessary, we will make the necessary changes, necessary amendments to meet the current, current meaning 2024, 2025, conditions and needs and aspirations of our people at that particular time. So what may I appeal to those of you with expertise in all kinds of areas to contact us just like we did in the People's Manifesto. If you have any ideas and you want us to know, please let us show. We can't know everything. May I also add that if you decide to join us in this exercise, there is no remuneration. It will be voluntary. You have to have time to come to meetings. You have to have time to analyze documents for us. You have to have time to keep your eyes and ears open. So whatever you see or hear in society, you pass it on to us in order to formulate the kinds of policies and programs to meet the kinds of conditions we will face come 
2024, 2025, and 2026. Because as I said, should we win in 2025, form a government on January 7, 2025. And I don't see why we shouldn't. And should we fail to begin to show some semblance of readiness to address problems, the same folks who created the problems will turn around and tell the impatient population that we told you that these people were not capable of, just like we are saying it now. So whatever they we're doing to them, whatever we're saying about them, they will begin to say the same thing about us. And if the end result will be loss of confidence in the two political parties and eventually loss of confidence in our democracy. What happens after that, I will not stand here to predict. You and I know what the situation might be. So, my dear and fellow Akatabansonians, in a nutshell, these are some of the issues I wanted to share with you. That one, be proud to defend our record in the social sector, in education, in health, in just about every aspect of society. And together, we would struggle, we will find a way or we will make one. I wish to thank you so much for giving me this opportunity. And again, the party, chairman and stuff. I hope I have been able to keep with to time. Oh, I you have. have. You have. So I have you more have. time. Thank you. 30 minutes. Thank you. Please, a round of applause for Professor Dansu Boafo. Really, really thought-provoking conversation there. And my takeaway is the assurance that indeed there's already a team in place working on how to confront the challenges that are ahead of us, considering the mess that is generated by this current government. Often, I meet people and the question they ask is, well, you guys, it seems you don't appreciate the mess that these people are creating. Are you sure you can handle it when you come? I like this assurance from Professor Damsubuafo that yes, our party is thinking ahead into the future and well ready to clear the mess. And we have a record of doing that. After all, we are celebrating 30 years of a tradition that ended the decade of decay in our country. So indeed, when we say we have the capacity to do it, it's because we have done it before. Before the Fourth Republican Constitution, before the Fourth Republic, was a series of coup d'etats that did not allow for sustainable development. We as are proud descendants of a tradition that stopped that. And I'm sure that we will do it again. So please, a round of applause once again to Prof. So they tried to bury us, like our chairman and others spoke about. After the 2000 general elections, the determination was to make sure that we will not even be able to contest the 2004 general elections. They tried to bury us, but they didn't know that we were seats. They didn't know that the great NDC will germinate and grow stronger. So on this note, shall we borrow the lyrics of the Accra House of Oak Club team? Arose, arose, arose. Be quiet and don't be silly. We are the famous NDC. We never say that. Arose, arose, arose. Be quiet and don't be silly. We are the famous NDC. We never say that. Whatever they threw at us, we will use it as climbing blocks and continue to make the difference. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, it's now my pleasure to invite as part of the vanguard of the party, a lady who has also been in the trenches 
from the beginning. A member of the 31st December Women Movement, a cadre of the revolution, a secretary of the unit committee of the CDRs, a zonal woman organizer, a deputy constituency woman organizer, you name it, a deputy regional organizer, a regional woman organizer, a deputy national woman organizer, two time deputy national woman organizer, and a deputy national propaganda secretary of the party. MP for a constituency with an interesting name, Pusiga. He's a member of FEC, a member of NEC, and a member of the ECOWAS Parliament. Ladies and gentlemen, Hajia Ladi. She's a Moshi woman, by the way. A round of applause for Hajia Ladi, who is a member of parliament for the Pusiga constituency. And by the way, she's a Moshi woman. I can see another Moshi man sitting there, Baba Jamal. After here, you can follow me to the car. I have some dirty linen for you to wash. Thank you very much. Before I start, I think I'm normally interested in the revolutionary song. So I would plead with us all, at least we've been sitting for some time, let us sing that revolutionary song to awaken us and to help us celebrate this day better. Yeah. Revo, revo, revolution has a long way to go, but has come to stay. Revo, revo, revolution has a long way to Go, but I come to stay. Kedes, Kedes, but the revolution has come to stay. Revo, Revo, Revolution. Has a long way to go, but has come to stay. Oh, Aluta, oh, Aluta, oh, Aluta, continua, 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 oh, Aluta, oh, Aluta. Oh, Aluta, continue, continue, continue. Thank you. Thank you. Chairman for the occasion, Nana Tudazi, our national chairman, Honorable Ufoso Ampofu. Our General Secretary, Honorable Aseid Unkatia, alias General Mosquito. His Excellency and Honorable Al Haji Idris Muhammad, Chairman of our Council of Elders, our revered Professor Jenana Opoku Ajman, my big sister. My big brother, the first general secretary, Alaji Hudu Yahaya, the leader of the minority, Honorable Haruna Idrisu, popularly known amongst us as approved, colleague MPs, comrades, the 31st December Women's Movement, if some of you are here, 
my sisters in the great NDC party, let me first of all thank the organizers of this program for giving me this opportunity once more to come up here and to say one or two things in support of, of our party and the recognition of women. Mr. Chairman, before I start, let me first of all acknowledge the fact that for some of us, without His Excellency, the late Jerry John Rawlings, we wouldn't have been part of this system. We recognize him. In doing so, back in our regions, our constituencies, our districts, we had persons or individuals who encouraged us and ensured that we were part of it from day one. My brother, my comrade, Jacob Baba, Norbert Awule, may their souls rest in peace. I wouldn't forget some of the first persons, although they might not be here, although they might be somewhere, but I believe at all costs, there is no way they would ever vote against this party, even if they are peeved. So let me acknowledge Honorable Martin Amidu, Donald Adabre, Donatus Akamuri. Let me also be grateful to the family of Baba Dapore, our first regional chairman. I wouldn't forget of Peter Tashiri, who is my constituent. He is still alive. He is an NDC. The whole of his family are NDC. Some of his children are executive members, and I really appreciate that. Atimbila Lale is one of the persons who even has a spot in Puzga. That is a barrier named after him. We have Idris Osman, one of the fine cadres called Teacher Idi. We have Isaac Awande. We have Madam Fati Musa. We have Madam Laurentia. We have Howard Control, David Arouk. And maybe it has skipped some of us. I wish to remind us of Mr. Aboni, uh, who unfortunately had a stroke and has not always been with us. Then I would like to also be grateful to my sister, late sister, Mrs. Janet Atugba, mother of uh, Raymond Atugba. I wouldn't also forget about David Arook. Ladies and gentlemen, my duty here is to talk about the formation of the party and its growth. But where did we start when it comes to women? Women were not left out. And I want us to note one thing from the revolution coming to the 31st. That when His Excellency, the late President, Jerry John Rawlings, came up in the revolution in 1979, Back 1981, there was no difference, and he never put any clause that bad men or women from being part of the revolution, and for that matter, part of the NDC. We were all involved. Mr. Chairman, there is one issue that has always kept me worried. I have observed with interest, and I think Professor Danzo, who spoke before me, made a statement, and we need to be conscious of that. That is, if we are gone, we would go with our ideas and go with whatever we know. 
those who will be coming after us, will they know? Because we are not being asked. Mr. Chairman, one observation is that people try to run away when it is mentioned that there was a revolution and that the NDC has been part of a revolution. It's quite interesting. Are we the first to go into a revolution? Are we the first country? No. And we will not be the last. Let us continue to acknowledge the fact that yes, because that is our root. That is how we started. We cannot run away from that. If we run away from that, we will be, we will be missing a step. And we have the French Revolution, 1789 to 1799. The Haitian Revolution from 1791 to 1804. The Chinese Revolution in 1911. That paved way for the Chinese Communist Revolution in 1949. The American Revolution in 1763 to 1783. The Russian Revolution in 1917. There are countries that have gone through revolutions and today, some of us even want to go and live in their countries. And there is no single revolution that has ever occurred in this world that you can run away from any issues that come with that revolution. Mr. Chairman, I am a member and a proud member of the 31st December Women's Movement. I have always been and I continue to be, although we might have our lapses, which is normal. There is nothing that is 100% under this sun. And so we cannot say we are 100%. Mr. Chairman, permit me to lay the fundamentals why the revolution, AFRC, PNDC, then eventually the NDC. The June 4th revolution or uprising in 1979 arose out of combination of corruption, bad governance, frustration among the general public, and misunderstanding within the Ghana army. It was incited by the arrest and trial of Flight Lieutenant Jerry John Rawlings and other junior military officers who were detained and charged for mutiny for a failed coup attempt on the 15th of May 1979. On June 4th, after the trial of Flight Lieutenant Jerry John Rawlings was found guilty and imprisoned in the guard room for two weeks. In the trials, Flight Lieutenant Jerry John Rawlings accepted all charges and asked that all his men go because he was responsible. But before he could be executed, his friends in the Ghana military, led by junior officers and the ranks, overthrew the then military government of General Frederick Kufu in a coup on June 4. 1979, the junior officers and the ranks and files set His Excellency Jerry John Rawlings free from prison and installed him as head of the government, the Armed Forces Revolutionary Council. Mr. Chairman, if you listen and analyze this situation carefully, you would realize that the revolution was not meant to sabotage anybody, and that we, especially women, we were the sufferers, because we were those who were in the kitchen, and we were feeling the heat more than any other person. Mr. Chairman, there are some individuals whom I can tell you that they do not know and they do not understand why the revolution, the pain, the pain which Ghanaians went through to even get Gary, I won't talk of milk, sugar, I will not even mention sardine, led to this. And women were the sufferers. Mr. Chairman, based on this, there were a lot of women who were involved, who were part of the PNDC, before 
the NDC. And Mr. Chairman, I can assure you, we have a few of them who really worked hard. And after the PNDC, then NDC, they continued to work and they were role models. I would first of all mention my mother, Nana Konedu Ejuman Rollins. And I'm most grateful to her. I appreciate her. And I wish, I wish, I wish that we come back together. I pray for that. Mr. Chairman, Anna Enin was a member of the government of the PNDC in 1983 and served until 1989. In 2019, she was appointed for the conflict resolution of the party. Dr. Mrs. Mary Grant was a member of the PNDC and was appointed Secretary of Health from 1985 to 1989. I would not want to mention all her positions for the lack of time. Ama Ata Edu was Minister for Education under the Provisional National Defense Council from 1982 to 1983. Joyce Ai, Joyce Ai, many people do not know that she's even ever belonged to our side, not to even talk of the fact that she had ever been appointed in any position. From 1982 to 1985, she was appointed as the Secretary of Information for the PNDC. 1985 to 1989, 87, Minister for Education. 1987 to 88, Minister for Lo of Local Government. 1988 to 2001, Minister of Democracy in the Office of the Prime Minister. And from 1993 to 2001, a member of the National Defense Council. Mr. Chairman, these are the women that we have. And these are but some. I am emphasizing on this because if we talk about women in politics, and we talk about women in decision making, and we talk about the involvement in the birth and the growth of women. Some people feel that it is just by coming into the party and becoming whatever you are or whatever you want to be. No, the party started with women. The party started with women. Mr. Chairman, we have Madam K. Sarah Mensah, we have Betty Mould Idrisu, my big sister and my wife at the same time, Hannah Sewa Tete, Juliana Azuma Mensah, Zita Okayokwe, Ekuya Sena Dansua, Sherry Ayite, the late Amabe Iwado, my big sister, Honorable Marietta Brew, Professor Jane Nana Opokua Jima, my big sister, <laughs> Honorable Elizabeth Ofosia Jari, the late Jifa Aku Ativo, Nana Oyelita, Honorable Helen Ntosu. Madam Cecilia Johnson, Madam Cecilia Johnson, and Madam Lucy Mbon, who was the Deputy Regional Minister. Mr. Chairman, all these women, as I have mentioned, most of them were part of the 31st December Women's Movement. Mr. Chairman, for the women to be involved, the 31st December Women's Movement had its branches right from the root of every community. The women worked hand in hand with the CDRs and took up positions 
as PDCs and the unity and the unit zonal constituency and branch levels the, the above branches embrace the women and involve them so when the NDC was formed women were happy to go with the party that got them out of the kitchen and the shadows of darkness the only the other parties portrayed them as servers of men bearers of children and acceptors of any decision without involvement mr chairman if today any political party parades women as part of policy or decision is just an afterthought and it's quite glaring as can be seen in the current administration that doesn't have a single woman as a regional minister this is an insult to women as regional ministers if they have appointed any other i have not heard and i don't know this is an insult to women because i don't see what the 60 men can do that women cannot do <laughs> mr chairman i have been corrected that at least there is one woman but i think that is an afterthought that is an afterthought mr chairman when we returned to party politics in 1992 his excellency along the then national executive and other hard-working women did not forget to involve the grassroots so most of us whom you would find that are very fine in politics and with ndc are from the grassroots the 31st december women have schools day nurseries in basically all the communities that they had offices we were part of decision making we were given the opportunity to represent our people we went on mr chairman today some of us can proudly say that if there is any woman in politics worth its sort who believes and thinks that yes a woman can also be part of decision making can also be involved in activities with men thanks to the ndc thanks to the 31st december women's movement <laughs> mr chairman before i could even come out and join not even men but boys to chat it was very difficult but when the 31st came and the NDC accepted us women and gave us the opportunity we were involved in at every level of decision making name it right from the unit committee mr chairman we have come a long way the party has done its best the women have done their best they have worked hard they have agreed with the party and i want to congratulate every woman for being there for the party <laughs> mr chairman if today we have some women who are part of the national executive it goes to tell us how far the ndc has actually involved and accepted women mr chairman because of the way in which we have always accepted and involved women you would realize that some of our programs that we have had very good ones excellent ones to even groom the little ones are issues that the current government has let's take the girl child the education of the girl child we supported them with school uniforms supported them with sandals we supported them with sanitary parts today today it is a big issue no sanitary parts for them 
most of the, 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 the children, the girls especially, are not able to go to school or some of them even stop going to school because they either don't have a uniform or they have a problem. Mr. Chairman, I want to appreciate this party for giving women another opportunity. That was in 2020 to have picked Professor J. Nana Opoku Ajiman as the running mate. All the women here, I can see my sister Barbara Asamoa, whom we came in and struggled together. I can see the national women organizer. Please let us get to the women. Let us ensure that the women come up. Mr. Chairman, it was mentioned here that the Constitution is one of the things that we are proud of. And it was mentioned that all persons from all walks of life were there. Market women were part of it. Queen mothers were part of it. Bread bakers were part of it. Drivers were part of it. Now, if that is the situation, today, how will someone else come and want to think that they love or have women better than us? No! Mr. Chairman, today, we have 20 women in Parliament to our credit. We have 20 women. And I can assure you, our leader is not because he's sitting here. I can assure you he has always done everything possible to support us. All I want is that we, all of us, we should continue to support women because we are part of the cradle of the NDC. Please, let us think of the party first. It's the party first. Not me. If you think of me, you may not want the party. But if you think of the party, then we all come back together. The senior cadre came out and said, let us think about the party and all other things later. You may not like me for any position. You may not like me for any office. You may not like me for any club. But like me because I am a member of the party and that I will vote for the party. Let us continue to be each other's keepers. Let us continue to understand the fact that if today it is me, tomorrow it might be another woman. If you do not have a sister, definitely you have a mother. So let us be each other's keepers. Let us stick together. Let us work in unity. When the positions and the contests come at the branch levels, let us support the women to also be part of it so that they can be part of the constituencies, they can be part of the region, and eventually be part of national. Let us get out of the fact that the position for women that is reserved is only treasurer or national women organizer or just whatever they think that is left oh let us let the women also be part of it otherwise they will say we didn't involve them no no let us fight let us fight that is how far women have come i wish us all the best in today's celebration and i hope that we aren't just talking we would make good use of all the good things that we have heard and that we are going to fight together because insha allah insha allah by the grace of the almighty allah 2024 insha allah by the grace of the almighty allah we will win and we would have higher numbers in parliament and we would make sure we actually support and work for those that we represent not not for ourselves i thank you very much i'm very grateful and have a blessed day hey hey
Thank you very much, Haji Aladi Aisha to Ayamba, speaking on the role of women in the formation and growth of the NDC and challenging her fellow women to rise up to the occasion. The minority leader in parliament, Haruna Idrisu, has been singled out for praise when it comes to his support for women. Leader, if you didn't know, I am telling you, there are some men, some men MPs who are considering wearing skirts to your office to seek support. Because they say when the women come for support, they get big, big support. So next time you see some of us in skirts in your office, know that we want the big, big support. So. Anyway, thank you very much. You know, Hajia has been very thought-provoking. In the story of how Jerry John Rawlings, our founder, declared that all his men should be allowed to go and took responsibility and how he was subsequently rescued from prison. A saying that has never hit me, hit me so hard. And that, I believe, is the spirit of the NDC. One for all and all for one. One for all, he took it for all and the all in the end rescued him. One for all and all for one. So long before the talk of women empowerment and the unfortunate cluelessness that some leaders have shown recently, it is clear that Nana Kunedu Ajman Rollins was on the side of our founder Jerry John Rollins and with the support of many were already doing that which we are proud of as a party. And even in those challenging times, they produce uh, a boomlet. <laughs> I'm being warned, but I don't care. Zanato Ajman Rollins is right here with us. A round of applause for her. <laughs> well, you know, the finger was wagging for me not to do, but I don't care. It is called, our leader, our leader in parliament will say, Z, 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 it is called positive defiance. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure now to invite our next speaker. He's an academician and he will be taking us through, I'm sure, some very more thought-provoking issues. The political party branding, very, very important, especially for our party. Political party branding and electoral victory. I have the distinguished pleasure of inviting a distinguished lecturer of the University of Ghana, Legon. Not afraid to speak his mind on political and national issues. Very, very independent minded and very, very intellectual at that. A round of applause for Dr. Alidu Seidu. We can do better, Dr. Alidu Seidu is our next lecturer. Chairman for the occasion, Honorable Nana Atudazi, the Chairman of the Great NDC, Honorable Samuel Ofoswan Pofo, the General Secretary of the NDC, Honorable General Asidu Nketia, the Leader of Majority in Parliament, Honorable Haruna Idrisu, the Leader of Council of Elders of the NDC, Honorable Idrisu Mahama, Mahama Idrisu, uh, the former one mate of the NDC's flag bearer in the 2020 election, Professor Jenana Opoku Ajman, all other protocol observed. It is very, sorry, I'm very grateful for the opportunity given to me to be part of this program as a speaker. 
all the great speakers that came before me did excellently. And I feel that there's nothing left for me to speak about. However, I take consolation in the fact that their speeches have provided beneficial context for what I'm going to speak about. I'm tasked to speak to the topic political party branding and electoral victory. A brand is a unique attribute of something that identifies it and differentiates it from other things that are similar to it. In marketing, branding enables customers to make product and service choices using attributes that differentiate and identify them. In politics, electorates decide to vote for a party based on the attributes of that particular political party. And largely, they identify the party by its identity, candidates, and then policies. So mathematically, when we are talking about political party branding, we are looking at two things. We are looking at the identity of the party and then the image of the party. The identities are usually naturally given, but the brands can often be manipulated. What then is the NDC's identity? I went to check in the NDC's constitution, Article 5, Chapter 1, that speaks to the philosophy of the party, argues that the NDC is a center-left social democratic party that seeks civil liberty, social justice, equal rights, and opportunity for all Ghanaians before the law, irrespective of their social, cultural, educational, political, religious, and economic status. The NDC believes in a mixed economy in which there is state ownership or participation and or regulation of critical productive sectors, sorry, resources of the country. Another way we can identify the NDC identity is by looking at the aims and objectives of the party. The NDC seeks to promote participatory democracy and responsible government in Ghana. The NDC promotes the principles and values of social democracy in Ghana and seeks to build an all-inclusive social democratic political party based on the principles of discipline, internal democracy, and good corporate governance. There are lots that speaks to the identity of the NDC from the Constitution. How about the, the image of the NDC? In political branding terms, the image of a party is captured by what the party says, what the party do, and the policies that the party formulate and implement. So when you look at the NDC from this perspective, you argue that the NDC is a mass party that is all-inclusive. The NDC is people-centered. The NDC is a party of equal opportunities. The NDC is community-driven in terms of development. The NDC speaks to diversity. The NDC exercises decentralized authority. And the NDCs formulate and implement policies that are human faced centered. Notwithstanding this, in political party branding terms, political parties are often misrepresented and associated to images that can reduce their electoral fortunes. And in this sense, when we are looking at the NDC, it is often associated by its detractors and political competitors as a party that is corrupt, as a party that is incompetent, as a party that has a revolutionary antecedents, as a party that allows impunity, as a party that abuses incumbency, and as a party that is irresponsible. I will address this negative uh, image later in my presentation. Concerns. Why am I so worried about this? Because the brand of the NDC has been hugely contested at two different levels. First, there is an increasingly negative portrayal 
of the NDC as a party is candidates and the policies that the NDC implements. Second, there is a great contestation by its competitors in the traditional preserved social intervention policy space. Whenever we talk about the NDC, we know the NDC has championed in the formulation and implementation of social policy programs and interventions in this country. Now, there have been a lot of competitiveness in that particular policy space. It has been politically litigated and is now becoming a grave landmine. So what? If we allow this negative portrayal of the NDC and the contestation of the policy space of the NDC to go unchecked, then people will assume that the NDC is what people say it is. But two, it also creates a very bigger impression and often perpetuated by people in the media space that the NDC and the MPP are the same. If this impression is allowed to stand, it has the potential of wiping off the clear differences between the NDC and the MPP and confusing the electoral choice of hardcore independent voters. It will also, thirdly, diminish the selling points of the NDC brand and eventually affects its electoral fortunes. The focus of my presentation. I'm going to discuss, having said all this, the NDC brand, largely in comparison to the MPP, at three different dimensional levels i.e. the party, the candidate, and then the policy. I will then tease out the NDC's positive image in response to the negative images that have been portrayed and then make a strategic recommendation. In political party branding literature, three important issues are used to distinguish parties from each other. The first is the party itself. The second is the candidates or candidates that the party have always presented, elected for elections. And the third is the policies that parties formulate and implement. When you focus on the party, there are two things that you can largely use to evaluate the party. One, the natural character or identity of the party, which can widely be seen in the constitution of the great NDC, and also some of the great policies that it has implemented. But there's also a presumed, perceived, borrowed attributes that is often associated with the NDC. So when we assess a party brand, we look at several variables. The first include the historical origin of the party. How did the party evolve? The second include the social identity of the party, including the religious, ethnic, geographical identity of its membership, the people that fund the party, and the networks that the party affiliates itself with. When you assess a party brand, you are looking at the ideology of the party. You are looking at the leadership of the party. You are looking at the track record, that's the performance of the party. You are looking at the attitudes and behavior of the leadership of the party. And you are looking at the mobilizational structures, approaches, and policy options of the party. On this particular score, I seek to compare the NDC and the MPP based on party branding. One, when you look at the historical origin of the NDC, the NDC has been ethnically and social diverse group. That of the MPP is based on dominance of majority ethnic groups and social groupings. Ideologically, the NDC is a center-left party and state-oriented. Ideologically, the MPP is a center-right party and private sector-oriented. In terms of social identity, the NDC is diverse. The MPP is based on dominant groups. They draw their support from specific dominant groups. In terms of leadership, the NDC has a decentralized authority. Party doesn't just concentrate at the level of the center party is decentralized to the grassroots for them to be able to benefit from it. The NDC MPP exercises a concentrated authority. On the score of track record, 
the NDC has a good record in social infrastructure and rural development center. The MPP is internationalization driven, urbanized, expans expansive, and rely largely on capital market orientation. In terms of mobilization structure and approaches, the NDC is decentralized and diversified and focus more on the local economy, whilst the MPP is internationalized, centralized, and focus more on capital-led interventions. In terms of policy positions, the NDC is a social policy-oriented party and enhances local participation and highly expansionist at the local level. Whilst the MPP triumph more in economic policy, internalization-oriented, and rely more on capital market-driven policies. The second variable that we use to distinguish between political parties in Brandon is the candidate. And when we are looking at the candidate, we are looking at the natural given attributes of the candidate as well as the perceived attributes that are often associated to the candidate. So when we assess candidates in political party branding, we are looking at their fiscal appearance, we are looking at their attitude or temperament, we are looking at their behavior, we are looking at the community of origin, we are looking at their social identity, especially the kind of networks that they build. We are looking at their competence, expertise, skills, knowledge, experience, and we are looking at their track record in terms of performance. When you measure these variables against the MPP and the NDC, you tend to realize that in terms of fiscal appearance, the NDC have presented more younger political flag bearers compared to, the NDC, compared to the MPP. The NDC's temperament or attitude of the leaders that they have elected have always been very ordinary, whilst the MPPs project an elitist leadership attitude. In terms of social identity, the NDC has always been diverse, and the MPP has always been seclusive. In terms of community of association, the NDC has always been diverse. The MPP has always triumphed on dominant groups. In terms of competence, the NDC provides a hands-on practical competence. The MPP provides an administrative competence. In terms of track record, the NDC is well noted in the expansion and development of the public sector, while the MPP focuses on the private sector. The last bit of evaluation in speaking to political brand is the policy. And the policy can be an action or inaction. When a policy is an action, it is a purposive act that is intended to achieve a desirable outcome. When we evaluate policies as part of political branding, we look at the policy origin. Where do the ideas of the policy come from? We look at the policy personification, i.e., whether the policy is caring, whether the policy is brutless, whether the policy is inclusive or exclusive, whether the policy is unifying or is diverse. We look at the structure of the policy. How is it formulated? How is it implemented? How is it evaluated? We look at the target audience. Who are the people that the, part, the policy focus on? And how can those uh, policies enhance their welfare and well-being as citizens? And finally, we measure the outcome and then the results of those policies. On the score of policy difference, the NDC stands apart from the MPP. In terms of policy origin, the NDC is social and local mobilization driven. The MPP is economic urban mobilization driven. In terms of personification, the NDC has always implemented people-centered policies and measured the impact of those policies on improving the lives of the people. The MPP have imp implemented market-driven policies. In terms of structure, the NDC has always implemented decentralized, local authorized driven policies. The MPP has implemented concentrated national authority driven policies. In terms of policy targets, the NDC always identified the, the needy
groups in society, people who are so deserving of the policies and implement it in a way that they live better off than they used to be. The MPP is perceived all inclusive. You say the policy is universal, but at the end of the day, few people benefit from it. In terms of implementation, the MPP NDC is locally driven, whilst the MPP is centrally directed. In terms of policy performance and outcome, the NDC always focuses on the design, sorry, defined poor and how to better their lot, whilst the MPP resource benefit already advantaged groups in society under the practice of what? All inclusive. Having said this, and teased out the differences between the NDC and the MPP in terms of policy, in terms of candidate, in terms of party branding, it is very clear that the NDC's brand is quite different from the way it has been presented and misrepresented. On the occasion of the 30th anniversary celebration of the NDC, I wish to pro provide 30 solid outstanding image and brand of the NDC. One, the NDC is an ethnically and socially diverse party. Two, the NDC is ideologically center-left. Three, the NDC is state-led in policy orientation. Four, the NDC practices a decentralized leadership. Five, the NDC guarantees media freedom. Six, the NDC expands civic space. Seven, the NDC allows societal participation in decision-making process. Eight, the NDC promotes social justice and equal rights. Nine, the NDC is an equal opportunities party. Ten, the NDC has a diversified community of association. Eleven, the NDC's leadership have hands-on competence. Twelve, the NDC practices good corporate governance principles. Thirteen, the NDC guarantees the basic rights of the basic human needs of everyone. Fourteen, the NDC is a transparent and accountable party. Fifteen, the NDC's policies target a defined need group. Sixteen, the NDC is responsive to the needs of every Ghanaian. Seventeen, the NDC stands for the rule of law. Eighteen, the NDC is a social equality party. Nineteen, the NDC supports common property ownership. Twenty, the NDC provides a socially diversified leadership. Twenty-one, the NDC provides distributive democracy. Twenty-two, the NDC creates wealth for every Ghanaian. Twenty-three, the NDC is a listening party. Twenty-four, the NDC has elected much younger party leaders in the fourth republic. Twenty-five, the NDC convinces with reasoned arguments. Twenty-six, the NDC guarantees freedom of speech. Twenty-seven, the NDC tolerates divergent views. Twenty-eight, the NDC provides reasonable leadership when in government. Twenty-nine, the NDC is consensus-oriented. And thirty, the NDC espouses a policy of good neighborliness when in government. So the voters should not be deceived about the portrayal of the image of the NDC. But there is a puzzle. In spite of all these good things about the NDC, why is it that they have been able to share power equally with the MPP in the fourth republic in terms of electoral victory? Now, the NDC started as a product-oriented party. In product-oriented party, political parties assume that they are the best and they have the best of features brand image and identity and for that matter political parties would sorry for that matter electors will vote for them no matter what so we often say that a mercedes benz sells itself because of the prestige of the car so as a product oriented party the ndc has always sold itself to the electorates and in this sense they always think about what the party sorry it always focuses on what the party thinks the people need and aspire to do it for them but over the years, we have realized that the voter is now becoming increasingly sophisticated and rational. And for that matter, you cannot just sit and say your brand sells for itself. You have to go out there and reach out to them. So the NDC shifted from a product-oriented party to a market-oriented party. And in a market-oriented party, you identify the needs of the consumers and tailor your product to suit that particular needs. 
So the NDC has always put the voter in its consideration and policy formulation and responds to the needs of the voter. But we have realized that there are a lot of things that has changed over the years in terms of who the voter is and in terms of how political parties brand. So the NDC needs to shift away from a product-oriented, market-oriented political party to a sales-oriented political party, where political parties design strategy that takes advantage of the prevailing economic and political situation, regardless of what the voters want and what the voters seek to achieve. And this requires a lot of strategy. Strategy is very important in the sales-oriented political party branding. Strategy is defined as a preferred method of doing something. And winning strategies are determined by prevailing realities. And what are the prevailing realities of our current political dynamic? It is competitive. And in competitive elections, it is a zero-sum game. You either win or you lose. You cannot lose and win at the same time. So if you don't win, you are going to lose. And if you don't lose, you are going to win. So the NDC needs to decide whether they want to win or they want to lose and go for it. The current prevailing strategy crafts the political scene in such a way that the NDC is facing a very strong, determined, and unrepented competitor that is willing to do everything in its competent might to be able to win elections. In the prevailing current political circumstances, the election management body, that is the EC, is highly unpredictable. And any strategy moving forward will have to take care of the unpredictability of the EMB. If the EMB is unpredictable, can we say the same about the judiciary? It is very difficult to predict what they're going to do. And that is part of our electoral politics now. The voters have become very rational and sophisticated. And what they demand and seek is usually beyond the scope and imagination of political parties. We need to study them and be able to work with them. We live in the prevailing political circumstance where monetization is highly key. And previous speakers have spoken about it. It is no longer a party that have good policies, a party that have good leadership, and parties that, parties that can perform. It is now political parties that can expand benefit and patronage. And the strategy moving forward into 2024 must take care and cognizance of this. And the last prevailing circumstance is vigilante driven and violent prone elections, where political parties are willing to recruit and use vigilante forces and state security apparatus to be able to achieve what they want to achieve, whether it is lawful or it is not. What is the implication of all these things that I've said? In my attempt to differentiate between the NDC brand and the MPP brand, I was thinking of what? Arguing largely and clearly so that voters can truncate the widely held view that the NDC and the MPP are the same. They are not the same. Two, to emphasize the clear difference between the NDC and the MPP at the level of what? The party, the candidate, and then the policy. When I'm able to do this, I'm not sure whether I've succeeded, I'm able to provide a hardcore independent voters a clear electoral choice. And that will increase the selling point of the NDC as a brand. And for that matter, make the position or position the NDC as a party with the political party. In talking about all this, what do we need to do? One, it is critical that the NDC spends time to demarcate the population in very defined frames, according to the three dimensions given above in this presentation, in order to be able to understand the voter population and be able to get enough data to be able to target them appropriately. Second, there is a this is necessary in two forms. One, in terms of policy formulation for manifesto development, but also in campaigning operations, including both national and local level communication strategy. When this is done, the party can distinctively convince Ghanaians how and why it is different from all other political parties in this country. By intuition, the general population seems to be heavily tilted towards the attributes and the values that the NDC represents. However, this perceived identification must be grounded with real campaign strategy and real data that will be able to help the NDC self-mobilize and be able to, to organize and believe in itself and be able to bring all voters on board, both floating and party-aligned voters. 
I thank you so much for listening to me. May God bless you all. Wow. Wow. Hasn't that been just wow? A round of applause. Another one, please, for Dr. Alidu Seydou. Wow. He's a senior lecturer at the University of Ghana Political Science Department. Really, really taking us through an amazing lecture of how best the NDC can brand and rebrand. I did say that he is one who is not shy to speak his mind intellectually and powerfully. And he has done that in a very remarkable way. You know, in the face of the failure of our opponents, if you have noticed, they are very comfortable when people say we are all the same. Have you noticed that? They have become very comfortable when people say we are the same. NDC and PPP. They have become very comfortable in the face of their failure. And that is why this lecture for me is important for us to begin to distinguish ourselves from them. And I hope that uh, party leadership will take note and guide appropriate communication and branding moving forward. Please, another round of applause for Dr. Ali Dusebi. We are taking it down now, a notch down, because we are about wrapping up. And we couldn't have ended our lecture series any better. Let me at this point invite a poet to uh, make us more thoughtful as we digest the presentations that have been done by our distinguished lecturers. Cassidy is the poet to do us the honors. A round of applause for Cassidy. This is a special dedication to John Dramani Mahama, the royal son of Boli Bamboy, the great son from Boliura, Sir Muba Yata, to the Jagu John Dramani Mahama. Power belongs to you 2024. and reinforce the porous economic foundation Ghana stands on. Come and rescue and restore the lost globe of Ghanaian. Come and take over the steering wheel of the Ghana Wutong bus nearing this at the Woody Mountains. Yes, power belongs to JDM. Who didn't use power to abuse, to insult, to cast insinuation, to mock anyone? No. John Mahama handled power in the belly of his hands to employ sober minds, to liberate, to emancipate people from mental antagonism. John Mahama didn't use power to show loud mouths and pomposity to ridicule and show the respect to chiefs and people. No! He uses power to encourage, not to intimidate. He uses power to allow wisdom 
to prevail. John Mahama did not use power to bully, but to protect, direct, counsel, and judge correctly. But Opana, Ahomasu Opana, uses power to huna huna people like Frankenstein monster. As soon as he, as soon as he said, Monster man here, I will bring heaven to earth. Archangels were part of the ministers. Angel Michael, army commander. John the Baptist, council of state chairman. Mary Madeline, gender minister. Apostle Peter, finance minister. Finally, Apostle Barnabas, IGP. But today, what did we see? Sasa won some budgets. Obnoxious policies. A hand down commentaries. Cut throats in windows and watch them. One opener. One's power, sweet talks, drunk calipo, mouth watering promises, sat in throat rock, drank throat of my Timpoku to King Kanwe, mm, pretending he belongs to the mob rowers, the downtrodden. But when Opana got power, buffing in sky, having behold. One chair, one unconditioned car, one sofa. Power belongs to John Mahama. He uses power to uplift people's spirits. Wipe tears on sad faces. Create peace in societies. Help business to grow. Accept responsibility. He uses power progressively. Use power to put broad smile on the face of the masses. Power to provide infrastructure. Even diplomats. Respect to Mahama. JDM uses power for others to aspire to his power. Uses power to build bridges across homeless to villages for easy accessibility. Really, power belongs to John Dramani Mahama. John! John! I want you to do something. soon. What do they do? Hiring expensive deaths women without profit. Opana. Luxurious lifestyle. Puncture deep holes in a public purse. Truly, power belongs to JDM. Use power to discover potentials and talents. John Mahama will use power judiciously to hold this popular nonsense and the unnecessary killings. Support John Mahama to gain power to continue to create continual atmosphere to boom businesses. That's the leader we demand. That's the leader we request. We pray for. We cherish. We adore. We are yearning to ascend to the throne. We will vote massively for John Mahama. Nothing less, nothing more. This is the stone the builder refused. The people's conqueror. John Mahama used power to demonstrate loyalty. Commitment, sacrifice, dedication to the National Democratic Congress. Truly, John Mahama will use power judiciously to repeal the Tutaboto of Bonson D. Levy Act. Rescue Ghana. Comrades of the Umbrella Fraternity. My blood is sitting, my heart is aching, my feet are trembling, and my soul is itching. 
For go must I to pour libation, calabash, fresh food of palm wine. And when the battle cry begins to sound, J.J. Rollins will shall rise. Thank you. Right, thank you very much. That's a revolutionary poet, Cassidy, for you. It is time to have some remarks from the elders of the party. To start is a remark from the general secretary of the party, Johnson Asiedu Inketia. Let's put our hands together for him. Before he takes the microphone, let me appreciate Wazo TV for staying through with us, Pan African TV, TV XYZ, Ahoto FM, and Radio Gold. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, your General Secretary. Mr. Chairman, permit me to stand by the protocols already established by the earlier speakers and to address everybody as comrades. Comrades, I believe that this is not the time for long speeches. We have had so much that to attempt to add anything will be to dilute the very wonderful speeches that have been delivered by our speakers today. So I'll just take only three minutes and I'll use two minutes to acknowledge some of the great names that contributed to the formation and growth of NDC to date. I know that everybody contributed in a way, but it looks as if we have not compiled the list. So each speaker comes and adds some of the names as the earlier speakers were acknowledging the great contributors i was also penciling down a few of them which i think needs a mention i like to recognize the contributions of the following comrades comrade sam garba Comrade Papa Datsun of blessed memory. He played a very wonderful role at the Consultative Assembly during the formation of the party and the wing of the party called the Front. I like to congratulate. Uh, I like to recognize Comrade. Quenumeto of Greater Accra. He was also in the first parliament, but before then, he did so well at the formation of the party. And then we appear not to have mentioned Nana Udru Numapau, the Esumijahene of Ashanti. Who says Ashantis are not NDCs? I like to acknowledge Nana Akua Kusapong, a very good friend of my former deputy Elvis. <laughs> I like to acknowledge the good works of Honorable Ousu Achampong, the first majority leader in the first parliament of the Fourth Republic. I'd like to acknowledge the contribution of Comrade Guzitano. 
I'd like to acknowledge Ama Chavez, Honorable Ama Benua Do. Then, Comrade Kwabrachre, one of the Deputy General Secretaries who served under Comrade Hudu. Then, once we, are, we, we, we all believe that the foundation of NDC was laid during June 4th and 31st, then we cannot forget Osahene Bwachijan, who was one of the key architects of the June 4th. Then I'd like to acknowledge the contribution of Comrade Atabedi Akon. Unfortunately, the body is in the morgue as I speak now. Comrade Atabedi Akon led the kids in German to arrest Ali Dujiwa, who attempted to topple the revolution. So Jiwa was arrested in German in Brongahafu at that time. And he was not arrested by soldiers or by the police. He was arrested through the bravery and courage of ordinary kids of the revolution. And one of their leaders was Comrade Atabi Diakon. And then Comrade Sherry Aite is not with us here, but her contribution cannot be glossed over. And then one very important comrade who was in charge of mobilizing hairdressers, dressmakers, butchers, and all class of artisans throughout the country to support the party in its early formation. And I'm talking about Comrade Vaughn Williams. <laughs> then comes Comrade Dr. Tony Edu. And then I think the Ahoy brothers are still alive, but we need to celebrate them too. So the contribution of the Ahoy brothers, Uncle Atu Ahoy, cannot be with us here. Professor Kwame Ahoy, I don't know whether he's around, and Kwesi Ahoy. And then I don't remember hearing the name of the chief architect, Comrade P.V. Oben, among the names that have been recognized. And then one of the most hard-working workers at the NDC headquarters, he served all general secretaries up to my time. Comrade Hudu. I want you to remember Comrade Adika. Thank you very much. That said, I just want to say that we adopted the slogan of a rescue mission for the 2020 elections. Unfortunately, that mission was not quite accomplished. But developments since then has made it more imperative for us to continue with the agenda to rescue this country. And if there is anybody here who doubts whether Ghana needs to be rescued at all, I just want to leave you a quotation which I picked from the works of Professor Joseph Stiglitz, a professor 
at Columbia University. In his book, The Price of Inequality, How Today's Divided Society Endangers the Future. Then I will leave you, compare the situation we are in today and draw your own conclusions. But I believe you agree with us in NDC that this nation actually needs to be rescued. <laughs> Professor Stiglitz stated that when you see that in order to produce, you need to obtain permission from men who produce nothing. When you see that money is flowing to those who deal not in goods, but in favors. When you see that men get richer by graft and by pool than by work. And more importantly, your laws don't protect you against them. But the laws protect them against you. When you see corruption being rewarded and honesty becoming a self-sacrifice, you may know that your society is doomed. Ladies and gentlemen, I leave you to compare what is happening in Ghana now. And I have no doubt that you, you agree with Professor Stiglitz that indeed Ghana is doomed and we need a rescue mission. Thank you very much and I wish you happy 30th anniversary. Thank you very much, General Mosquito, the only general in Ghana politics. Honorable Asedu Nketia, sometimes I enjoy his lectures when he tells us how in Parliament, as a then member of Parliament, they led from the back. And you will know that he has always been, as we say in Ghanaian parlance, Kantan Cross. General Mosquito, thank you very much for your presentation. Well, since uh, many of the uh, speakers have acknowledged people, um, one comes to mind. In fact, I was told that uh, he will even be here. Honorable E.T. Mensa. Is he around? Is he around? Okay, I was told he'll be around. I think that these are all people who have paid their dues to the formation of the NDC. Now we'll move on to our next speaker. And he is difficult to introduce because he's a man of many parts. But one thing has been consistent about him. He's been an activist almost all his adult life. Activist at heart. A student activist a lawyer who is an activist, a NUCS president like never seen since, a youth organizer of the National Democratic Congress like never seen since, a minister of communications, a minister of trade, a minister of employment like never seen since. Should I go on? A minority leader who in the first term led the NDC side to equal the numbers of the party in government. I have the distinguished pleasure of introducing to you the Member of Parliament for Tamale South and Minority Leader in Parliament, Honorable Haruna Idrisu. Thank you very much. The Honorable Sohina Alassan for those warm and complimentary words. To our national chairman, the Honorable Fuswan Pofo and General Secretary, to Alaji Mahama Idrisu, chairman of our Council of Elders, 
Professor Nana Opokwa Jiman, and to all other executives, including our very distinguished Nana Atudazi, chairman for this auspicious landmark of 30 years of maturity, 30 years of birth of a new political paradigm, the National Democratic Congress. Those of you who are students, those of you who are students of history, you can even ask some students of the Nana Dudankwa Free Senior High School. If you ask them, including JSS students, the dominant political traditions of our time, you are more likely to get the NDC or the MPP or the MPP or the NDC. We have come to stay as the new political force in Ghana, contributing to its democratic consolidation and continuing first to the growth and development of our country. I intend to speak for 10 minutes, taking advantage of five additional minutes from the General Secretary and my own five minutes. So on behalf of the NDC Minority Caucus, let me convey to the national leadership of our party our warmest felicitations and best wishes at 30 years anniversary of the great Akatamansu family. And to assure you of the determination of the group to work with you and the grassroots and all other structures of our party to rescue this country from the non-performing party referred to as the new patriotic party. And that we owe it to the memory of our founder and leader, President Jerry John Rawlis, to the late President Mills, and the likes of the late Justice D.F. Anand and Captain Retired Kojo Chikata, and to all those who have made enormous sacrifices from the branches through the district to their, through the constituencies to lay their lives for the formation and eventual maturity of the NDC as a new political force, we say Aiko. And to those of you sometimes very critical of the NDC, let us all remain united. When our national chairman of Osuampofo was addressing us, he highlighted three values, unity, stability, and development. To the Ghanaian people and to the new patriotic party, I say without any fear of contradiction that there is no political party as successful as the NDC under the Fourth Republic. I say without fear of contradiction that there is no political party that has contributed to the economic, social, and democratic transformation of our country than the National Democratic Congress. I heard Professor Dan Subuafu attempting to explain to us how the thinking of a national health insurance began, but lately implemented by the new patriotic party to which they take credit. We understand you all right. But at least what we should accept is that the National Democratic Congress have contributed immensely to Ghana becoming a beacon of hope and a champion of democracy in Africa and in West Africa by facilitating and participating in all the best political traditions that have happened from 2001 through 2005 to 2009 to 2024 that we are certain that the NDC will recapture political power. To my colleague members of parliament, the focus should be on how do we join hands with the national executives 
to increase our numbers beyond 137. At least lessons learned, we now know the value of just one seat. If we had 138, 139, we probably could suffocate them better and demand justice to many other decisions that they have forced through. But at least as our brand expert Dr. Siri said, the NDC can learn from a brand of a party which is an amalgam of diverse personalities with diverse views from different backgrounds of our country contributing meaningfully to the social and economic development of our country. I cannot proceed further without also acknowledging how Elijah Hood Yahya then recruited a few of us quietly into the NDC by saying, come and assist me to draft this statement. Little did we know that we will end up also playing major roles as in the party today. I should say that having followed him and Dr. Chambers, it took Atua Hoy to then adopt me and my group. So to many of the young people who are even in parliament today, we owe it to the tremendous purpose and tenacity of Atua Hoy and the Ahoy family in bringing and guiding us. And to the young ones, lessons to learn. Elijah Muhammad Idris, as we are told, have laid his life in the service of our country. At least I've learned one unique thing from him that I may share with you. But at least I was telling our distinguished chairman that I enjoy what Captain Chikata used to call me to order anytime he was unhappy with the minority leadership. His first question to me would be, Haruna, how is the spirit the core of the caucus and the minority group? So to all of us, at all times, let's ask for the spirit the core of our party. To what extent are we holding hands together to work together to win political party power to change the fortunes of our country? At least their generation, you see them every day. Now, let me come to the economics of it. Those of you who even say, I had uh, Dr. Seydou from University of Ghana, that's the beauty of intellectual debate. This country, Ghana, all said to Jerry Rawlings and the NDC of a liberalized economy that allowed for private participation in the economic management of this country and not to the new patriotic party. <laughs> Historical fact. This country, even in terms of economic performance, and that will be my concluding message, leaders of the NDC, members of the NDC, let's be proud of the NDC legacy and nothing more. We have an unenviable legacy when it comes even to the performance of the economy. Today you are talking about inflation at 27%. Under President Mills NDC, we achieve consistently over a long period of time, probably unparalleled, the single digit inflation sustained over a period of time. Under President Mills and the NDC, we achieve the highest growth to the gross domestic product of this country at 14.1 percent unparalleled in our country's history under president john dramani mahama we achieve unparalleled infrastructure expansion in this country and i just share a few with you as i end that is why we say be proud of our legacy whether today nana adudanko is boasting about kumasi airport or tamale airport the foundation stones were laid by the NDC and by John Draman and Mahama to liberalize and open up this economy for expansive trade. That happened. Don't use only Terminal 3. Don't use only Terminal 3 as your judgment. At least, uh, I see Prof Professor Nana smiling. Unlike them, we expanded access to tertiary education. But we didn't go about naming the universities after people. That is what they are very good at. We create the institutions. We expanded access to tertiary education. You can count of a tertiary institution in every other part of the country, whether in the Volta region, in the northern region, the UDS led by Jerry Rawlings. But we're not smart in naming it after persons who have served our party. So probably in future, we will learn from them.
My quest for the NDC is that we should remain a party of opportunity. Opportunity for youth, opportunity for women, and provide the protective space for our women who may not be able to engage in the rigorous blackmail campaign. But probably working with the national executive, we need to draw a roadmap and a new strategy as to how to determine members of parliament democratically whilst waning and watering down the influence of money in the choice of our candidates for competitive elections within the NDC. The minority leadership and caucus will be happy to do a fair assessment of our candidates and their constituencies in order to guide future action. At least to General Asedun Katia and to Kofiato. And that is what warms my heart today. This is not the NDC where Isif Wali just declared by popular acclamation Kofiato elected, Asedun Katia elected, without subjecting them to a democratic process. So we have come very far and we need to deepen the values and ethos of democracy within the party, give opportunity to every other person within the party to realize their full potential within established rules and norms established by the party. And more importantly, as was observed, discipline within the party is important. Let me conclude by assuring you that those of you sometimes who are unhappy with the minority we are not a perfectionist group, but at least we are a group that has produced for you a speaker. Even with 137, it's no mean an achievement to have Alban Sman Bagbin, in whom we trust that he will deepen the values of transparency and accountability and make Parliament a more formidable institution. But at least even as we celebrate it, let me now come and pick a slide from Dr. Sedu when he talks about predictability of the judiciary and the dilemma of a political minority of 137. Those of you who are quick to blame the NDC minority for E-Levy, E-Levy was not introduced by John Mahama, neither was it introduced by NDC, nor introduced by the NDC minority in parliament. Place the responsibility and blame squarely on the non-performing Nana Adu Dankwa Akufu Adu. We have done our utmost best. I've seen those of you question even our judgment in going to the Supreme Court. And probably, Chairman, I end on that note. Ghana is a country governed by law. We are very convinced that there is an assault on the rule of law. And as you observe, Dr. Seidu, this is not a country where freedom of expression is respected as it ought to be. This is not a country where media independence and freedoms is respected as it ought to be. This is the first time in our nation's history that the country stands too divided and polarized against a president who is insensitive, who would not listen, who prides himself in borrowing. And I just end on that note that we have a proud legacy. We must be ready to defend the legacy of the party at all levels across the districts and regions of our country in terms of infrastructure. As I observe, if John Dramani Mahama as president was going to Buru as irresponsible as they did, he probably could have tripled the kind of infrastructure they are building today to which they say that we should give them credit. At a time of living office, we left a national debt of 120 billion. Today is 400 billion. And GDP, 81% of our national debt is used in servicing GDP. And they will tell you that they are better managers of the economy. Let me conclude once again by thanking all of you, thanking my colleagues in parliament, and say, if for nothing at all, the NDC have produced for this country responsible leadership. From General Rawlings through President Mills to President John Dramani Mahama, and is prepared for the future to do more. I thank you for the opportunity. Thank you very much indeed. The Honorable Minority Leader and Member of Parliament for the Tamale SAF constituency. Thank you. Thank you so much.
Well, <laughs> um, so he says we must put the blame squarely where it belongs. And we shouldn't be shy about it. If you send Momo and you get any, uh, you know, uh, overtaxing, just say, oh, a bananado. Eh? Let me take this opportunity to also acknowledge a few people whose names I have not heard. And I'm sure it is not deliberate. It is because of time and because many people, um, perhaps, it escaped them. We just sang our party anthem. Jewel Aka, may his 